Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, so I'm Michelle Stribling. I, I work in internal communications here at Google, and it's my pleasure to introduce Monique Maddy today. Um, Monique Maddy, as many of you know, is actually a Googler. She joined Google.org in October of 2005. She's also an author, and she's here to talk about her book, which is called Learning to Love Africa, My Journey from Africa to Harvard Business School and Back. Monique is originally from Liberia, and she's now a US citizen. <laughs> and in true Google fashion, she, is, she has an elite, elite education. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University, a master's degree from Johns Hopkins, and an MBA from Harvard. So we can certainly vouch to her incredible credentials. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cold. She has worked for the United Nations Development Program on Development Issues in New York City, in Angola, in the Central African Republic, and in Indonesia. In 1993, she founded the African Communications Group, which was later renamed Adisimi. Monique has also brought a special guest, and I trust that many of you are, are feasting on his treats today. Her guest is Jean Barbeau, who figures in her book and also happens to be an, an amazing pastry chef. Um, he's brought samples of his famous croissant, pain au chocolat, and pain aux amandes. Uh, Monsieur Barbeau? Monsieur Barbeau, tu peux te rester debout? <laughs> So, so, without further delay, I'm very pleased to introduce Monique. Please give her a warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming here today. Um, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you, or most of you, haven't read the book here yet. So. I, what I'm going to do today is just throw out some of the, some of the highlights of the book. Uh, but there are about four themes in it, and I'll go take you through each one of them. And hopefully after reading it, you'll be inspired to go and uh, read it from cover to cover. Uh, the first one, let me just say how I came to write the book. I origi it originally started out as an, a Harvard Business School article that I had written after I had run my company, the Adisimi, the African Communications Group, which was a telecommunications company that was designed to build uh, wireless infrastructure in emerging market countries, particularly in Africa. And it was at the end of, uh, we had liquidated the company, and I was writing about the, the experience after seven years at the helm of the company uh, for the Harvard Business Review, and I was approached by HarperCollins to write a whole a, a book on the subject. And once we started doing, or I started doing the work, uh, they thought the whole story was quite interesting because the article was re primarily about entrepreneurship in developing countries, and um, they found that uh, you know, there were central the several themes in my life, so I, life that I, I had been an entrepreneur, I had worked for the UNDP, I had grown up in an entrepreneurial family. So it was very much um, what, what could we learn from all of those various experiences and apply it to a, an area that I care a lot about, which is poverty alleviation. So the, the book goes is in, again, it goes back and forth, but it's in, there are four central themes. African entrepreneurship, international development aid, and by that I mean the United Nations, World Bank, and all the efforts that have been made to alleviate poverty. And then what I feel which is most per pertinent to all of us here today, I think, is the role of business in poverty alleviation. And since Google is quite new to the game, I think it has a unique opportunity to really make an impact. And then I, in, throughout the book, again, I also talk about the African people themselves. And I think the best way for me to illustrate that, and the reason he's here today, is really through uh, Babu, who you just met. So um, again, the book is somewhat historical, because I talk, I'm talk, now I'm going to go to the first theme, which is entrepreneurship in Africa. And the book goes through several centuries of, of African history through the eyes of a certain group of West Africans, a group that I come from, or at least a part of my family comes from, which is the Madingo people, who had networks of uh, trade that, that really extended from West Africa all the way to 
um, the Middle East and Europe, and they, where they traded gold in exchange for cloths and other materials throughout basically the, um, from the fifth century where there were really big kingdoms in, in West Africa and uh, all the way to, the, mid to the, um, the Middle Ages. And what you'll find is that uh, until around the Middle Ages, Africa and Europe were very much along the same path in terms of economic development, which is something that I, that I only really discovered as I was doing the research for my book and trying to sort of do the parallel um, the chronology of both continents at once. And then once the uh, slave trade was introduced, that's when things really began to fall apart. And then, of course, you had the, the wealth that was created in the, in the new world, which led to the industrialization and so forth in Africa. Rather than continuing to build the infrastructure, um, the, the, many of the chiefs preferred to actually export people, which ended up being the slave trade to the new world. So, that's where the big um, disparity is. But as I said before that, there were there was, uh, uh, lots of uh, kin kingdoms and also lots of infrastructure universities and all kinds of developments that were going on on the continent. So I think it's important that when, even though, and then we had colonialism, which you know, lasted for 150 years in Africa. And, and there also the entrepreneurship was basically killed and it was mostly government, um, the European governments, principally uh, Britain and France, and to some extent Portugal, that were running these countries and really um, exporting the, the raw materials to further the industrial efforts elsewhere in the world. So I think it's important that when we, when we look at the Africa today, we have to understand that the countries, most of them got their independence in the 1960s and after. So it's in, in terms of going of how we measure the continent and how badly it's performing, I think it's important to note that we, we, we do have those, these economic roots that go way back in history, but somehow they've been, um, the, the new governments that replace the, the colonialism haven't, haven't really um, stepped up to the plate in terms of letting their entrepreneurs thrive and creating an environment. And added to that is, the, um, is my next topic that I'll go to, which is the international aid business. Uh, until uh, the 1960s, or actually in 1940s, um, when the UN was created, um, the countries were p basically running on their own. Um, then you had the creation of these development aid agencies, which um, up, to, like up to about last year, about $2.3 trillion has been spent in, the, um, in an attempt to alleviate poverty. So when I, when I was growing up, I always thought I wanted to work for the United Nations, and um, I thought that was a way to alleviate poverty. Even though my family was entrepreneurial, my father um, had a restaurant and did other, many other things, I thought that the best way would be through the UN. Um, and that was because that was its mandate, at least for UN, United Nations Development Program. And so, um, as Michelle mentioned in the, in the introduction, I, I, took, I had assignments in um, Indonesia, Angola, the Central African Republic, and eventually Central um, Indonesia, New York, uh, Angola, and Central African Republic, where I eventually met Babo. Um, and what I found was that we were giving money principally to the governments, and the governments really weren't doing it. I mean, we had very little contact with the people, and we weren't even making a dent in terms of um, poverty alleviation. And first I thought, okay, well, maybe it's just because it's this country, let me, you know, in my next assignment, things might change. And unfortunately, it didn't. And then as I looked at, at around the world, and this has proved true now, the countries where we see the most economic growth and poverty alleviation, so in countries where it's really the private sector, not governments, that are driving growth. And even though it might, it, it, it's, um, it's not politically correct to say this. Um, I think in many cases, economic aid has worsened the situation of many of these poor countries, particularly Africa, because as I said, it, it enables, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't give any, the governments, for the most part, the incentive to reform and to allow entrepreneurs and businesses to play the role they can in poverty alleviation as, they, as they've done in other parts of the world. So um, my next theme is, the role of business and how and why I believe that business 
where many people believe it's, um, you know, many multinationals at least, uh, believe that businesses are exploitative of people and resources, and that they don't contribute to economic growth, and rather that they exacerbate it. My, my experience has been quite the contrary, and um, I'd like to illustrate with, some, with a company that you're all familiar with, and then go into my own experience and why it's possible for me to be even, to even be here today. Um, if you take Henry, if, if you look at it from just if you take it from the perspective of a develop of a development agency, they don't really have an incentive to alleviate poverty because if you alleviate poverty, you have a whole machine that has to be dismantled, and that just I mean if you know if you're familiar with bureaucracies, that doesn't happen very easily. On the on the contrary, if you take a private company. They have every incentive for all the, the people that are at the bottom of the pyramid, we talk about four billion people, to emerge from poverty because that, that means more markets, new ideas, and just uh, greater prosperity globally. So it, it makes sense that, the, um, that business would want to advocate for poverty alleviation. The question is, no business seems to have found a way or they, at least they haven't made it their sort of their core mission. It's sort of been a, by, a byproduct because they create jobs and, and so forth and they invest in infrastructure. But if you think about Henry Ford, he's the one who had the wage incentive and he said, you know, he didn't want to, make, to have people who could just make cars. He wanted people to buy cars. So there's no equivalent in the development aid agency. And so, I think that's why you can see that $2.3 trillion can be, can be spent, and I don't think any private company would be a going concern if they had spent that much without any results. So that was what led me to, um, so again, so just to bring it to my personal experience, when I was, I, as I, um, I'm from Liberia originally, from the very northern part of the country, which was um, very, just a bit of history on Liberia, which was founded by American slaves that had gone back uh, to Africa, just a few of them. But they became the elite of the, of the country and really treated the, the native population with, as if they were um, you know, savages or whatever. And so there was a big disparity there. And up in the northern part of the country, uh, they, they discovered iron ore. And in this, in this area, they were, I mean, there were just a few villagers living there. They had no, I mean, no education or no roads, nothing. I mean, it was just basically bush. But uh, a, a Swedish industrialist, I'm sure you've, you've heard of the name Wallenberg, because they have, um, it's a big um, industrial family in Sweden. Uh, one of the, uh, the major family members discovered um, the, he, he put together the consortium of companies, American and Swedish companies, to go and um, explore the iron ore mines there and, and extract the iron ore. But in order to do this, because everyone was, I mean, there were just a few people to begin with, and because everyone was illiterate, um, they had to build an entire infrastructure. In, a, in other words, they had to build rail, railroads, they had to ba build houses, they had to build <laughs> schools. They, and it, it, was, it was company self-interest, but it was also somehow enlightened by the shareholders of, of Lamco, which was the name of the company, that they had to treat the, the employees much better than they would have been treated if it was the government that was, um, that was uh, ruling them or whatever. So an entire infrastructure was built, and that was the infrastructure into which my family moved. In fact, my father was one of the first employees of the, country, of the company. And um, because of that infrastructure, you know, you had people now that were getting educated, they were getting jobs, and when they got jobs, they had disposable income. So when, the dispos when they had disposable income, that created new markets. So some of, some of the people, my father included, left the company to start his own business and sent, and sent me and my brothers away to school. So this is the kind of cycle that business can create because they, when they invest, there's a huge multiplier effect as opposed to a dollar of development aid, which pretty much it remains a dollar or sometimes can even be negative. Um, so it was in thinking of, um, thinking back of the, uh, over my, um, my childhood growing up and the opportunities that this private company had given me that I decided after five years with the United Nations that I should 
you know, that this wasn't the way to alleviate poverty. And it's, it's funny because um, at that time, I was in the Central African Republic where, as I said, I had met Babo, who he, he, he doesn't speak English, so he's not. Um, but uh, that's where, and he, he had, when I told him, he thought he was really, not just him, but many others in the UN thought I was crazy to, you know, here's a secure job, you know, why are you leaving, um, you know, you have it made. And, and, um, and I, I just thought uh, we weren't helping people, why should I, you know, and we were making quite good money not helping people. So, so I decided to go to, um, to apply to Harvard Business School and figure out how, what another approach, maybe launching my own company, but knowing that it would be a private sector solution. Um, and I think it's important for me to say too that um, Babo thought, because I had all of these things, at, at the time I had a car, a house, and you know, everything else, he thought you, know, you should be happy, you know, you should, everything should be great. And, and I always used to tell him that he seemed much happier than I was because he had a, a, almost nothing. But he just, uh, you know, he had this calm and, and uh, sense of balance or whatever. So, so I, did, I did leave, and that's when I started this telecommunications company in, to, with, a, with a classmate of mine from Harvard Business School. We raised up about, um, when it all was said and done throughout the, the seven years, we'd raised about $25 million. We had built infrastructure. We'd put the team together. Um, we created a number of jobs um, in three different countries, and we were about to acquire um, some additional uh, companies when essentially we had a major um, difference between what we call the, the do-good investors and the do-well investors. The do-well investors being venture capitalists who had invested in our company and some of the more UN-type investors. And the venture capitalists being business people really wanted to see the company grow and eventually go public and get into multiple countries, whereas the um, do-good investors, again, going back to the UN model, they, did, they wanted to see only modest growth because, I mean, they, they want to help poor people. They don't want to help people do too well. And that's sort of the cycle that, you know, it's, it's always um, the, the poor as victims as opposed to potential entrepreneurs. Now, again, that's changing a lot, and there's been a lot of movement in, in the industry. But and even the UN now tries to see, well, how can we support entrepreneurs and businesses and so forth. But they, I mean, they're bureaucrats. They don't have business experience. So it's very hard for them to teach entrepreneurship, um, even though they acknowledge that entrepreneurship is and um, job creation is the key to, to um, poverty alleviation because essentially you're helping, you're giving people the tools to get themselves out of poverty. Um, so, uh, so again, so why, why do I tell bubbles? So in this, th these are the central themes in the book and I go into each one in quite detail. And, and I mean, there's some really um, insightful stories about how life in the UN is. Also just as an entrepreneur, when I started my company, I had seen it with my father when he started his company, but, um, but as an entrepreneur in Africa, it's very, uh, it, or in any developing country for that matter, it's just so much harder. I mean, you, you're fighting, against, I mean, in, at least in the US, you have just the business to contend with. There you have the infrastructure, the government, the policy. So there's so many forces working against you that you can't really gain much traction. And you only, I mean, uh, uh, large businesses, like um, Coca-Cola or some of the other major um, companies around the world, they can withstand the, the ups and downs of these, the turbulence of these markets, but entrepreneurs cannot. So that's why you don't find too many uh, businesses that are scaled, and you find many small, isolated cases of success. So the, the real key is to try to find ways in which you can, you can get that kind of growth that the big come from the small company to the medium size to the um, to high growth companies. You know, so you have um, the, the microcredit, the SMEs, and you know the high growth. So, um, so again, so that's so that's when I decided when when we encountered all these problems running the company, the telecoms company. I decided, you know, that we that the only real solution to poverty alleviation would come from the business sector. Going back again to what I said about the the Henry Ford um, analogy. And, but I, I also thought, looking back at how much had been spent trying to alleviate poverty in the world, I also felt that um, 
it would have to, it, it wasn't money that was needed, it was new ideas, you know, bold initiatives that could really turn the development thinking on its head, not more money, because many people feel, you know, just give us more money, double the amount of aid. And I mean, if you think about it, it's all really arbitrary. If 1% of GDP or, you know, 2% of GDP will alleviate poverty, that's not the case at all. And so coming to Google, I think the, the, what drew me the most to Google was the fact that for the first time, a, a company was actually going to make uh, poverty alleviation a core part of its DNA. In other words, it wasn't just a corporate philanthropy, um, and that it was going to put its best minds, which is what is really needed, new ideas, new concepts, innovation, to tackling these problems, which is why I think that everyone here has something to contribute. Because if, uh, if you look at Bubble, I mean, there are four billion people who won't have the opportunity that, that we have and that we take for granted. So I think that we really owe ourselves and the world, even if, it, if, it's, if it's enlightened self-interest, to find new solutions because we don't have the tradition that other companies or foundations for that matter might be saddled with. And so those are the, those are the themes that run through my book. But at the same time, I, did, I would like to, uh, to end before I take questions um, with some with a cautionary note, which I talk about in my book, which is, I think um, Babo had, um, he, I mean, he, he, I, I think it's best if I illustrate it with, with just reading the, 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 a section from the book. And uh, to put it in context, it was after Babo had come over to, this is his second trip here, and uh, he had come over and we were running the company, he'd come over to spend a few months, about six months with us. And, um, you know, he was, you know, fascinated when he came. And now, uh, yeah, he, so he'd been here about six months. So, um, so as, as I talk about our taking businesses to Africa and doing, uh, you know, helping them uh, um, emerge from poverty, I think it's important to say, to, um, to say the following. Um, one day when his, early, <coughs> when his early fascination with the big building, giant supermarkets and shopping malls, and all the other symbols of modernity had begun to wane, Babu looked at me sadly. He said, Mama, the people in the street, they don't say hello. Uh, he had seen for himself what I had tried to explain to him, probably unsuccessfully in Bangui, that the cars, the houses, the clothes, the money did not make one happy. <coughs> After almost six months in America, he was aching to return home to his village, where, as he explained to me, when the people see you, they smile, and they say hello. <coughs> um, they take good care of each other, he explained, just as he had done so unwittingly for us during his brief stay. I could see the pain in his eyes, and I knew that it was time for Babo to go home. Um, uh, progress I have learned from people like Babo is an extremely delicate balance and usually comes accompanied by ver a very hefty price tag. For all its horrors, miseries, and calamities, maybe in partial compensation for it, and, pe and perhaps to help its people deal with them. Thanks. Africa remains the one place on this planet where one can still find Eden. As, Gra as the author Graham Greene so aptly put it, love stripped of all its trappings. So, so that was the cautionary tale. So if you have any questions, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, for sharing your, your story with all of us and for having the sort of the courage to, to talk about it so, so proudly. Um, I, have, I have two questions for you. Under the theme of what is, what is Google going to do in Africa? And I think the first part of the question is more as a company. I mean, we offer a set of services and products which are very relevant. Um, I'm curious how you think that would fit in Africa. And I'm also curious as to some of the more, I don't know, cultural challenges that we may face. 
considering that, for example, when we tried to go into Asia, we figured that we realized it's not quite as easy in different countries yeah. as it is here in our home homeland. Uh, so that's one question. And then on the other side, more for Google.org, you've talked a lot about the role of the business sector. What sort of private sector ideas do you think, or are you guys thinking about for, for Africa through the Google.org umbrella? Okay, great. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge two of my Google.org colleagues that are here, uh, Rachel Payne and Katie Wertz somewhere. Um, and we've been struggling with this very much over the past. I, I just joined uh, four months ago, and this is something that we've been working on. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think one, as I said, the way how Google.org uh, was created or, and the founders created Google.org was really not to just use Google and Google's products as, you know, the entry into these, these uh, markets, Africa included, but also to look at poverty just as poverty, regardless of what Google does. I mean, again, it's the, I think it's more the brain power that we bring to the, to the, um, to the, the issues rather than so much the products. So even though there will be overlap, obviously, you know, technology is a key component of economic development and economic growth. But we'll be looking at some other issues, including basic needs and and other um, aspects of economic development. I think what Google can bring is, new, as, I, as I said before, new solutions, new ways of thinking about these problems, and also ways that are more sustainable. So that 10 years from now, we're not looking back and say, well, we spent this much, and what did we get for it? We didn't get much. Um, so I think, we, as you know, we have a new executive director who's going to be starting in a little while. And these are many of the issues that we're going to be looking at. Um, and hopefully, I think poverty is very complex. We have, um, in these countries, we have both institutional poverty and individual poverty. It's not going to be one solution. I don't think there's a silver bullet. That, but one thing I can say, and, I, and um, you know, even though we haven't decided yet, is one thing we know throughout history is that the private sector has been the key driver of, econo of uh, poverty alleviation. If you, that's been consistent around the world. Some, of pe some people have come to that later, you know, the um, former Soviet Union, China, but you're seeing that all of these countries are reforming and letting the private sector um, play a much more prominent role. And what, um, what Google will bring, hopefully, is a new way of looking at this, especially as a corporation, looking at it from a, in a uh, more business way and look, valuing the people and what they can bring rather than just looking at them as victims in these markets. Um, and the cultural challenges, I, I think in my book I talk a lot about that and the importance of having really strong local partners and local participation in everything that we do. Because it is true, it's, it's very localized, um, the solutions. If you take the most successful uh, multinational companies, it's really because they found ways to really localize and involve the people at all, um, at all um, stages of the both the product um, introduction, expansion, and, and so forth. So I think I'm hoping that that's what we'll be able to do. And hopefully also Google.org and Google Inc. working together closely, I think we'll be able to find some really um, creative and innovative solutions that other companies don't have. I mean, where, you know, where the founders go and start their own company, f philanthropic arm. Um, this one, we have it all together, which really makes it really exciting. So. There was, was there another? Oh, Bill. So you had some pretty, what I would almost describe as damning words for the UN and the governments. Um, do you think they have a useful role to play, or are they mostly going to be obstacles in, in anything we try to do? Um, well, I th well, it's multifaceted. But I think um, the UN, as I said, poverty is complex. And if you have people in Sudan, for instance, right now, who are dying, they need urgent help. I mean, that's not where Google has its strength. They need short-term emergency aid. Um, and, you know, good, that, so that need is there, and it's going to be there, even if you're in a rich country. I mean, we saw Katrina, right? I mean, it happens everywhere. So that's a very different type of poverty then. And that's, again, what, what, we're t what I'm talking about here is long-term poverty alleviation, where you know, it's not just you know, for a day or two, you're providing food. I think what, what these people want is security. And security is best um, given in the form of jobs or something that's sustainable, so that at least you can plan beyond tomorrow or the day after. 
And that's where they are now. And so um, governments, again, I think it takes, it will, it's going to take a lot of um, discipline on the part of agencies such as the World Bank and the UN to really make the governments responsible to their people. Because if they aren't, there really is no incentive to, to change. And uh, you know, many people say uh, you know, we should get rid of the debt to the African government. And if you talk to many African people themselves, the people in the street, the barbers of the world, they say don't erase the debt because then they won't reform. We need because they never, they never benefited from the debt in the first place. So, they, you know, so you know, there's this disconnect between, you know, there are many people who, who want to do good, and they think they're doing good often, but the reality on the ground is very different. And um, so, yeah, so I think the, the, the role of the UN and other agencies should be more what, what they're good at, and governments should be you know, encouraged to really invest in their people, whether it's education, health, but you know, not not go into the business realm, which is better left to business. Really. Hi, Jenny. Thank you again for coming to speak and the wonderful chocolate <laughs> <laughs> croissants. Um, Babo Ella di Merci. So my question is: So you've had a firsthand experience of building a company, and had problems with the divergent wants of the do-well and do-good mm -hmm. investors. And if you were going to do it again, mm -hmm. starting today, do you think you could do things differently to succeed and have it move forward? And what, what would that yeah. be, like what your kind of learning take-home message yeah. to, to move forward for other people that are thinking about yeah. starting businesses right. there? Yeah, thanks for asking that, because that's something I, want, I wanted to address, actually. Um, if, if we as Google can find a way to support these entrepreneurs, these potential businesses that have the ability to scale, to grow, then I, I, that's what I'm in favor of. Because what we lacked, again, was the staying power, the, the access to governments, the access to connections that only a big company has. And if you can find a way to incubate these entrepreneurs so that they can focus on the business and we can to, ex to a certain extent, give them what we, what we, the benefits that we have as a big business, whether it's capital, as I said, expertise, then I think they have a chance to move and with them take a lot of other people too. Because as I said, with, a, with in, the, in the private sector, you have a lot of um, uh, the multiply effect where one job creates another, you know, and you have a market that's created. And I think that if, if, um, if Google can even just do that to create help, show, and not Google alone, because Google, I mean, even though it's big, it's not, I mean, it's, it's also the demonstration effect. If Google can do it and do it right in a few cases and show to other corporations or foundations that look, you know, giving people jobs or uh, creating um, sustainable business in these markets leads to permanent change, then Google would have accomplished a lot because it would have invented a whole new model. And I think it's uniquely positioned to do that because it has the best minds to think about it. I mean, there's not a day that I don't go to lunch or something with, or have an incidental meeting with someone who has a very different way of framing a problem that, you know, that just adds a whole new light to it that, that I think it's one of these breakthroughs that we're going to be able to, to put for out there that, will, that others will emulate, just as we've, um, we've innovated in the, in the software. Uh, um, in the search and internet uh, industry. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I was really inspired by you today, and I was just Thank wondering you. as what I can do as an individual to help Google um, reach that goal of becoming a model for other companies to make a difference in social causes. Like, what can I do today to, to get to that point? Well, I think um, one, of the, one of the good things is that we have the, through Google.org, we have this 20% time that, um, the, that the Google empl employees will be um, dedicating their, um, hopefully, some of their time to and brain power. And, you know, we've already, we, I mean, we're, since it was just beginning, we haven't put the mechanisms in place for, for that. But some people are already helping us. And, I mean, it makes a tremendous difference uh, when you sit around the table with someone, whether it's from, you know, BizOps or BizDev or CorpDev or whatever. Uh, you know, we all sit and look at the, question, the um, situation holistically. And we ask the probing questions. We, we, you know, we try to figure out, okay, what works, what doesn't work, what, what do we have to, 
um, what kind of, kind of uh, information do we have to see to, to see why it works and why it doesn't work or why it didn't work? So I think you're going to find that you're going to be, your services are going to be in very high demand very soon as we get this thing going. Um, Katie, do you? get involved right now. Um, a couple things, we're looking for an um, executive um, admin or administrative assistant. So if you know what you want within Google who might be good for that, let us know. And there's the contact info on that Sparrow page that you can link from our internal pages. As well as a couple other projects that you can help with for our current grantees, like TechnoServe, Acumen, that kind of thing. And they're listed there with contact info of who to contact if you're interested. Thank you. Hi, I remembered a couple uh, weeks ago in the uh, TGIF, uh, we talked about uh, Google should sponsor what kind of the programs or project. Uh, if it's too controversial, two sides, probably we will right. don't choose any size right. to sponsor as a co uh, company. And then I remembered my experience in UN training when I was, uh, I re represent uh, China, and we first have a big discuss with the Africa uh, trainees uh, yeah. about uh, a birth control, because to Chinese, uh, birth control is the country policy and really drive the country sustainable, uh, developed. And the, but to rest of the world, a lot of people really just feel like birth control is a evil. And so, but um, a lot of uh, programs for local localized level, they do need some uh, sub sponsors and the the. The program itself, it is controversial. I, I don't know what's your experience to address this. In particular, in birth control or? or? No, in, in several different, uh, the developing countries, a lot of the local program, mm -hmm. it's really work for local people. Mm -hmm. It really can help that uh, country, mm -hmm. but uh, to the rest of the world, oh, maybe okay. have controversial, uh, it's a to controversial topic. Right, and so your question is, would Google? Yeah, would what we? Google? Yeah, and the, whether you know how we can really approach to the greater good. Right. Well, I think I, hopefully we'll be in area. We'll try to stick to areas that are non-controversial. We'll have as little controversy as possible. Because one of the things that we will be trying to identify are solutions that are scalable. If it works in Africa, if it works in India, you know that you can take to many. Because that's one of the the tests of success, I think, how scalable it is and how replicable it is. So um, we might, I mean, I, I can't speak for the you know, executive director when he gets all the founders, but I, I mean, I think there are lots of things that we can do to help alleviate poverty that are non-controversial. And I think the, the areas where you're talking about tend to be more UN type work and that, right, and so they can talk to the governments and, and um, actually sort of try to work, to work them out. But, uh, my, my guess is that Google will try to do things that are, you know, that at least, um, and that's part of the discussion that we constantly have to ask all of these questions that um, I think the common goal that we all have is to get people out of poverty. And yeah. So. I was wondering if you've thought about collaborating with other large foundations as a way to leverage your brain power and, and money, um, you know, Bono and, um, Microsoft or the Gates Foundation is doing a lot of work um, in the world. And secondly, um, with the civil war strifes in Africa, how do you deal with a situation where you just can't go in and help the people because they're fighting against one another or their government is repressing them? Right. Um, well, for, on the first point, yes, I think we will need to leverage um, other institutions and work with them. And I think what's important here is what do we bring to the table? Hopefully, as I said, we'll bring new models and new ways of thinking and people will be, will be willing to, to work with us to experiment with, the, with these new models. And because again, it's all a matter of convincing others because we can't do it alone. Even Bill Gates has been quoted, you know, his 20 billion doesn't even make a dent. And um, you know, he, can, he can do all the vaccination campaigns and, so, and save, the children, but they save them for a life of what? So we have to look at 
what are, what are we saving them for? And I think, you know, if we can look at it more holistically, that will, um, that, that will definitely help. The second question was... Um, just about the fact that in Africa there's a lot oh, of the civil, civil right, wars yes. or repression by governments, and that seems to be a big obstacle right. in and alleviating the goals. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's that's very true. I mean, every day you, even when we were running my company, and um, and you know there was a day there was a fundraising. We were about to close like five million dollars or something, and then I think that was when the the bombs went off in Tanzania where we had our main operation. And so yeah, so there's all this instability that's there. Um, but again, it, part of it is because the governments don't have, I mean, the, the, the international community continues to give them economic aid. I, I think that there has to be a strong emphasis on, on policy advocacy to, for these governments to change. I mean, there have been some initiatives like um, Bush has developed the Millennium Challenge Account which only lends money to governments that reform and invest in their people, in their health, their education, and so because it's the truth, it, it, the money won't go anywhere, and they won't invest it in the people, and um, and at the end of the day, they won't be any better off, but will have just kept on writing checks. So I think, to the extent that once we start talking to other foundations and other um, uh, and other companies that we should talk about some of these things in terms of our responsibility to make sure that because we many of the private companies are also major um, the sources of revenue for the government in terms of taxes so they do have the ability to talk about that those things thank you yeah. hi Monique hey, thank you so much for coming today I've been looking forward to this for a long time and it was really wonderful. And um, if I can make a quick plug to the book, I actually had the opportunity to read it, and it was absolutely fantastic, and it really impacted me, and I really urge you guys to pick it up and um, spend some time reading it. Um, my question is thinking about really how many undiscovered Monique Matties are out there in the world, and thinking of how Lamco really gave you the, the uh, leverage right. to um, become what you are today. Right. How do we create more Lamcos when you're thinking the natural resources were their core business, and maybe a lot of those natural resources are depleted, or right. there's already it's just a saturated right. market. Um, are there other Lamcos that are going to be able to come into the 21st century and really make an impact and give people um, the opportunity to, to to take full advantage of what they have? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean Africa still has it. I mean, it doesn't even have to be only a natural resource company. Um, I think it's a matter of, and it doesn't even have to be a company that has a, a product that that's relevant to. That if you think about Coca-Cola, for instance, Coca-Cola is Africa's largest private sector employer. It, it employs 60,000 people, and for every one person they employ, they create 10 indirect jobs. So 600,000 people are employed because of Coca-Cola, and that's because they have everything down the value chain. They have you know, the, syrup, the, the bottlers, the, the kiosk at every single corner, so, you know, so that in every village you can find a bottle of Coke. Now, that creates tremendous value all across the, you know, from the, the syrup to the person who's serving you in the restaurant. And so, um, but many companies, when they start their corporate philanthrop philanthropic arm, they think, okay, well, let's give some books or let's give some, you know, food or, you know, supplies. That's not going to get people out of poverty. That's just going to make their poverty a little more tolerable. But if you really want to use your philanthropic do dollars, I think it's more important to use it wisely and in a way that's sustainable, that really creates change. And that's where I talk about valuing, um, valuing the people themselves and their ability to help themselves. I, Babo um, was just telling me, I, I didn't even know this, but um, he, the, the Chinese have been investing a lot in Africa. And I think they've taken a very different approach. They're looking at, at it as markets. And so they're going in there. They're not just doing... Um, you know, giving supplies and so forth. They're actually creating businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, I was looking at a project just, um, we were looking at some pilots in Brazil and, and one of them involved aquaculture um, to, uh, to um, develop fish, you know, for the markets and so forth uh, with, with the tilapia fish. And it was something I didn't know anything about. And, we, we came back and, and we presented it to Larry and Sergey, and you know, and Larry's like, oh, I think Sergey said, you know, well, what's aquaculture or something, and we were talking about it. And I went home, and I don't know how it came up, and Bubba started telling me about his fish tank and t tilapia and the fish he was cultivating in his, you know, back in his village, and he was wondering how his fish was doing. And he started telling me all about tilapia and, and aquaculture. 
And I said, well, what, what are you, you know, I didn't even know this, where, you know. And so the, so the Chinese, they had invested in him. He had taken some money that he had, I, I left him with a good retirement fund or whatever. And he, he, he'd gone to, um, to, these, to the Chinese people who were in Central Africa, all looking for business opportunities. And you know, he showed a picture of me and his trip to America and everything else. And they, you know, they thought he was a good friend. They said, remember, Babu can't read or write. And, um, and so they, they basically set him up with his, his fish tank, and he's practicing aquaculture right now. And his, you know, so it's really, you don't have to be a big company to find ways to empower the people. That's my point. So. Hello, Monique. Good uh, so uh, thanks to Babu's wisdom, you've already seen the flip side of, of prosperity. So my question to you is, uh, in your dreams, uh, in the ideal world, uh, your ideal world, what does the world look like? Hmm. Well, okay, it's really funny because I, I, that's why I read that last part with, uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of what wealth does and the kind of, you know, where he thought that because I had all of these things, I should be happy and so forth. And ideally, I try to spend at least three months or in Africa a year. I mean, just because you just, it's just so, simple and basic. I mean, and you know, can we find a way to, I mean, I think that people say, well, you know, you don't, many people say, well, you know, you don't want to destroy their innocence. Or, I mean, I think there's a long way between destroying the innocence and Britney Spears or whatever an other analogy you want to, to you know, to, to drum up, right? I mean, so I think, I think it's always important because over there it's true. People do take care of each other. They, they are, I mean, I think he's very, um, here, I mean, everything is mechanized. I mean, you know, you, everything's very isolated. And I think it's something that's very, even my mother who's lived here now for many years because she had to escape the Civil War. You know, she, she, she was here visiting recently and she was talking about how, uh, uh, you know, here, over there, people can just drop by people's house unannounced. And, you know, it really is a whole community. Whereas here, you know, it's really individuals and, and it's a very different, I guess, alienating way. So I, I don't know, but I think we, we owe them the, 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 um, the opportunity to decide for themselves at which, you know, how much they want to you know, ab absorb of our, our way, I guess, yeah. So. Any other? Okay.